Hey everybody, welcome once again to Word Addiction. This is your host, Reverend Lawrence Makumbi from Life Pool Chapel, Kitengela, the House of Faith. And today we are going to read through the book of Isaiah, chapter number 9, all through to chapters number 12. And I believe it's going to be a wonderful time in God's presence. Let us pray. Father, our Heavenly Father, you are glorious, you are awesome, you are excellent in all of your ways. You are full of goodness and mercy. And today, King of Glory, you have granted us the, us the mercy to see this new day. For it is not by anyone's you know, chance or choice for us to be here, but it is because that you have chosen for us to be here. And what a wonderful time and moment this is. As we sit down to read your word through the book of Isaiah, chapter number 9 to chapter number 12, I want to believe that your word shall become a reality, shall become insight upon our very lives. We honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we do trust, pray, and believe in. Amen. In chapter number 9, verses 1, the Bible says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali, and afterward more, heavy, more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder. The rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled into blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. You see, the great light, you know, that is seen upon the land of Zebulun, upon Naphtali, you know, it is a light of the revelation of God's grace. And this light, what does it do? In verses number, num number four, it says, As the light shines, the yoke is broken, the burden is lifted. And that's what revelation does. When someone accesses revelation, it breaks off any burden that, you know, ignorance had placed in their lives. And I pray today as you read through the word, as we follow through God's word, a light will shine as it lit upon Zebulun and Naphtali. You shall say your name as seen the light and every yoke that was upon your life, any burden that you carried out of ignorance, may that burden be lifted up and that yoke be destroyed in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 is a messianic psalm and it says, For unto us a child is born, uh, and, uh, uh, a messianic prophecy, sorry, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace so you know here that it is a messianic psalm because number one when you just take the word mighty god the name of the child the name of the son shall be mighty God, it's not with a small G, but it is with a with a with a with with a big G. Uh, you know, it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. So, unto the world, a child has been born into the world. But from heaven's point of view, it is a son that has been given. For so God loved the world that He gave His one and only. Begotten Son. So towards the natural, you know, uh, 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 influence or the natural happenings of the world, it is a son who is being born. But according to heaven's view, it is a son who will be given, the son of God, who shall be given to die for the sins of the world, that we who have sinned might live 
for righteousness and his name shall be wonderful his name shall be counselor mighty god everlasting father the prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of david and over his kingdom capital h there over his kingdom so he is a son who comes in the lineage of jesse in the lineage of david and is not just you know a, a ruler of an earthly kingdom he's kingdom god's kingdom shall be everlasting his kingdom will have no end the kingdoms of this world will have no end but the kingdom of god will not have an end to order it and establish it with what with judgment and justice from that time forward evermore the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this so what will perform this son what will perform for the child to be born for the son to be given whose name is wonderful whose name is counselor mighty god everlasting father the prince of a peace whose government shall be upon his shoulder what will cause this to happen the zeal of the lord in other words he says this that god will not rest until he has established this God shall not rest until he has established this. That's why you will see when we come to read the New Testament, the people there were looking for an earthly leader, a political king after the order of David. So when Christ came, who was the, who was the prince of peace, they did not understand him. That's why they were keep, keep on talking about when shall you restore the kingdom of, of, of Israel back? When shall you restore the kingdom of David back? They lacked the understanding that his kingdom was far above the earthly kingdoms. Why? Because the earthly kingdoms will come to an end. They have an end. When all is said and done, they will stop, they will seize, the power will seize, and all power will go back to him. He shall rule, we shall rule with him. Those who make it for a thousand years, we shall rule with him under the new heavens. We shall rule with him after the tribulation, after his second come, we shall rule with him. His kingdom will have no end. And for those of us who are called according to God's purposes and according to the name of God, those of us who have submitted ourselves under the salvation grace and we have been led by the Holy Spirit, steadfastly following after the heart of God, when all has been said and done, we shall reign together with him. The Lord sent a word against Jacob and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know. Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, what do they say? The bricks are fallen down, but will rebuild hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but will replace them with cedar. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spar his enemies on. Verses 12. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. He talks about Syrian will come and, and you know, invade uh, Israel. Uh, and, um, uh, look, you know, just like the Philistines were oppressing the children of Israel. Now, Syria will come. You know, we, we, we looked at this when we were looking at... Uh, Chronicles and the book of Kings where Syria was actually tormenting Israel over and over again even far above the way that uh, that Philistines did and you know it had to come to a point in time whereby the kings of Israel would sought for help from the Syrian and from the Syrian king and they would pay him due due fees for those services of protection and 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 you know being watched over by, by the Syrian a king and his army. Why? Because they had forsaken the Lord. They had forsaken the laws of the Lord. Everyone, every man acted in accordance to what their hearts 
felt the kings led the people astray, the priests were out of order, the prophets would speak and some of them were false prophets, would encourage the kings, you know, to continue in the same manner. We remember, is it uh, Jeroboam who used to have his own priests to serve of, over, over the, the idol that he had raised up in, uh, in, 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 the, in the northern kingdom of Israel? So that people cannot go to the southern kingdom that was in Judah and Benjamin, whose, whose resting place was Jerusalem, where the temple of Solomon was built. He used to say, anyone who desires to be a priest, you come and serve as a priest there. And so people were being led astray and forsaking God's word. And so for judgment's sake, God says, Syria shall come to devour you. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So God is not relenting. His anger towards Israel still stands. For, sorry, for the people do not turn to him who strike them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and the honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of the people cause them to cry. And those who are led by them are destroyed. Listen, therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evil doer, and every mouth speaks folly. So God says, I will not deliver you. Look at this. The kings, the prophets, and everyone, the kings and the prophets are leading. You know, the kings are leading, the prophets are like the tail, and the people have filled their mouths. You know, they're, they're, everyone is, is an hypocrite. And an evil doer, and every mouth speaks folly. Why? Because the word of the Lord has not been given the center stage. The laws of Moses, the laws that God gave through Moses, have been forsaken. What did God instruct? We have said this over and over again when we are reading the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, 1 to 9, that the word, you know, should be on their lips. Every time, everyone speaking to one another concerning the word of God. What have we been instructed? That we should continue professing the word of faith. Continuously speaking the word of faith. Why? So that our words cannot be, you know, uh, shall be shaped by what we say. Our words shall be filled with God's word and we shall be speaking that instead of falling. When God's word is not in you, then you are able, you, you are led to speak anything that comes out of you. That's why we have people talking prof profane words and they've said this, it has been like the order of the day. The politicians of the day, they're talking profanity. People even on the altar are speaking profanity. When we go to our social media platforms, profanity. When we look to the music and actual our local music, the ones that are trending, it's all about profanity. Why? Because that's what people are feeding. And the same will fall in the next generation if we don't stand up and proclaim God's word as it ought to be. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out as still. For wickedness burns as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as a fuel for the fire. He says, your land, your, your land will burn. And guess what? Your people shall supply the firewood to make that city burn. They themselves will be the firewood. They themselves will be the firewood. You know, when God sends forth his judgment, he's telling them, don't think that you people, don't just think it is the leaders. Don't just think it is the land. But you yourselves, you'll be in the center of that fire because it is you such men and women who have entertained wickedness, evil, profanity, folly, taking advantage of the fatherless, 
and the widows. You people, you will be the people that I will use as firewood when the city is being burned. For wickedness burns, uh, uh, sorry, uh, no man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own harm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, who is Manasseh and Ephraim, these are the sons of Joseph, the two tribes of Israel. You know, uh, out of Joseph, remember Joseph was no longer a tribe, but his children became separate tribes, so that, um, you know, the, the, the tribes of Israel can be 12 as the sons of Jacob, because God had taken for himself the Levites. So Ephraim and Manasseh, they are children who have come from the same womb, you know, uh, from the house of David, uh, sorry, from the house of Joseph, he who shall be blessed and he shall become like the, like the bow that spreads over the wall. He says, listen, Manasseh and Ephraim shall eat one another. Together they shall be against Judah. You know, uh, these two tribes always had uh, a thing against the tribe of Judah and more so when the, the King David was uh, was chosen from the tribe of Judah. It never settled well with them and we shall see it as we continue. What to those who decree and righteous decree? Who write misfortune, which are prescribed to do what? To rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. It's talking about people who manipulate the law to acquire property from the people who can't, who don't have fathers to defend. That they're, they're bringing up laws that will take the land of the fatherless, will take the land that is due to the widows and make it their own. So God sells them war unto you. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? When this day comes, what will you do? He says, you know what? You can manipulate the papers, but the day of your judgment will come and you cannot manipulate your misfortune. To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this is anger is not turned away, by his hand, but his hand is stretched out still. So God is not relenting. He's telling them, oh, you've been manipulating in the courts of law to take advantage of the widow and the fatherless. When your day comes, where will you run for help? And Isaiah tells them the hand of the Lord has been stretched out. He's not relenting. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my, my, my indigni, indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil to take the prey and to tread them down like the mare of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations, for he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno like Kachemish? Is not Amal? Is not Amath like Arfad, Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? So God says, you know, this Syria that I've brought to become judgment to the children of Israel, you know, once I have set it out, once I've sent out Assyria, he will come and destroy. He will declare to Jerusalem what he has, de what he has done to the other nations. And he tells them who, who shall be able to save you. We saw it when we were reading the book of Kings and Chronicles. You know, when they came and uh, is it during, um, was it, it was I think during Hezekiah's reign, you know, that, that he took that, 
a decree that the Syrian army had declared, the Syrian king had declared, and he took it to the temple of God, and he sat there in prayer because the day of judgment had come, and he sat there in prayer, and together with Isaiah, they proclaimed the goodness of God, and God fought their battles. So God is talking about the arrogance of the Assyrian uh, king and nation. And he says this, Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Lord has performed all his work using Assyria, you know, to, to fight over and to discipline the nation of Israel, all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, by the strength of my hand, I have done it and by, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also, I have removed the boundaries of the people and I have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has, has found like a nest, the riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth and there was no one who uh, no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with an even with an even a uh, peep with even a peep shall the axe boast of uh, shall the axe boast itself against whom against him who chops with it or shall the saw exalt itself against him who sows with it pride you know he's saying uh, this is an axe. I'm holding it in my hand. I am using it to chop off the tree. And now the axe begins to boast, talking about how it has brought down this huge tree. Knowing very well, as much as it is sharp, it was my intent to pick the axe and to say, I'm going to that tree. I will not crush that wall. I'm not cutting down that tree. It is not the palm tree, neither is it the fig tree. I am going for the almond tree. I am the one who has made that choice. And I'm the one who has chosen the axe, sharpened it and made it ready for service. Now the axe stands up and begins to boast, forgetting about the hand that used it to bring down the tree. And he talks this because that is what the Assyrian king and nation were talking and doing. They never knew they were the, they, they were, they were the servants of God against Israel for a punishment for that nation. As if a road could wield itself against those who lift it up or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. Therefore, he says, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. Listen, therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So, <clears throat> sorry, so the light of Israel will be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his stones and his prayers on one day, and it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child might write them down. In other words, when the Lord brings down his judgment, this nation will not be able to stand. They brag of its riches, they brag of the land, they brag of the forest, but once God is done with them, they will have none of them standing there. And it shall, it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them. You know, God is saying, when all is said and done, 
Israel and Jerusalem will come back. They'll call upon me. They'll turn. They'll repent. And that time will come when they will no longer wait for, for, the, for the Syrian because Syrian, the Syrians will come and defeat them and they'll be lord over them. And so it will, they will have to wait for Syria or depend upon Syria for their livelihood, for their protection against the people who are coming, the nations that are coming against Israel. So they'll be dependent upon Israel. But when Syria has boasted of its influence, of its power, of its, of, its, of its ability to subdue nations, including Israel, when God has dealt with the Syrian army, the children of Israel will, the children of Israel, sorry, will repent, and then God will punish Syria, and they will no longer depend on Syria. What does this teach you? Anyone you oppress, anyone you choose to fight against, anyone you think that, you know, that God is using you to punish them, be very careful. The days will come that the tables will turn. They will not need you. Just know you are a tool in God's hand. There are some of us that God uses us to bless others and we take it as an obligation and we take it as if they owe us. Do good and go. Don't be you know, arrogant because God is using you and is punishing someone else. Tables turn. Things change. God is an expert of change. Let me tell you. God is an expert of change. Don't think that things cannot change. I have witnessed it in my own eyes. There are people like myself, I would have written them off by the standards of men. But when God was through with them, they came back, they rose higher, they did great things with God, they walked with God, and they are names that you can reckon with up to this day. Do not despise anyone when God is dealing with them. So it will come that time that they will not depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in a truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For through, for for your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined and in the midst of all the land. Therefore, that says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation sorry, will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up as courage for him, like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. As his rod was on the sea, so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of their anointing oil. The yoke will be destroyed. This is the yoke of the Syrian. He says it will be destroyed. Remember, you went through this under the nation of Israel. It will be the same manner. But this time I will come back and I will turn, you know, the, the affliction that the Syrians have placed upon you, the burdens that Syria has placed upon you, I shall break and this shall be as a result of their anointing oil that he has set over the nation of Israel. As they repent, as they turn back, the yoke will be destroyed. You know, most of us, uh, you know, in life we carry burdens that are unnecessary to carry. And some of the burdens that we have over our backs, over our necks, it is because of a, you know, of a moment and a time that we walked away from God. We disobeyed him and we opened doors for the enemy to afflict us. So God says when the children of Israel repent, when they repent from looking unto man, when they repent from disobeying my law and they start calling upon my name, I will come down. The one who is oppressing them, I shall oppress and I shall break every burden, every weight, every yoke that has been raped placed upon the neck of the children of Israel and they shall do this by their anointing oil. 
That's what God promises. The anointing is a yoke breaker. When the anointing of God is present in your life, there are no burdens that you'll carry. And remember, we're not just talking about the anointing natural oil because that counts for nothing if God does not bless it. It counts for nothing. You'll just be carrying a religious relic. But the true anointing is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is in your life, no burden is allowed there. Why do we carry generational curses? Because the Holy Spirit has not found a resting place in your life. Why? When the Holy Spirit is in your life, is the Spirit of Christ. And Christ, when Christ lives in you, remember you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when Christ lives in you, the burdens, the curses, the generational uh, curses, they don't stand a chance. Seek, seek the Holy Spirit. Seek an impartation of the Holy Spirit and every chain and burden shall be destroyed in your life. He has come to Ahiath. He has passed Migron. At Mikmash, he has attended to, to his equipment. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken up lodging at Giba. Rama is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard as far as Lahish. O poor Anahoth, Anathoth, Madmena has fled. The inhabitants of Gemi seek refuge. As yet we will remain at Nob that day. He will shake his fast at the mount of the daughters of Zion the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord of hosts will loop off the bow with terror. Those of I stature will be hewn down and the haunty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets, thickets of the forest with iron and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. This talks about Jesus Christ. It is a messianic uh, you know, prophecy. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its of his root. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Underline those things. When the Holy Spirit is upon your life, what will you have? You will have wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel, you will have counsel and teaching. When you read through the book of um, the gospel of John, chapter number 14 and chapter number 16, it talks about the work of the Holy Spirit when he comes. He's a counselor. He will remind you and teach you. He will teach you all truth and remind you of my words. So the Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you, you will have wisdom. You will gain understanding. You will have counsel. You will gain the strength. The dunamis tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Acts 1 8. Uh, 1, 8. Uh, when you go to look at Acts chapter 10, verses 38, it talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It is the might that he had, that everywhere he went, he went doing good, healing those all of those who are under the oppression of the enemy. You will have knowledge and above all, you will walk with the fear of the Lord. If you see somebody who's calling themselves a believer and they don't fear the Lord, it is a sign that the Holy Spirit is not present in them. Why? When the Holy Spirit is present in your life, you will be pulled by desires of the flesh. You'll be you, you'll feel to do some evil here and there. You'll be led and feel attracted to do a certain evil. But the Holy Spirit who rests in you will touch you and tell you that is wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. He, when he's in your life, he will teach you to fear the Holy One. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteous, righteousness shall be, uh, shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of is a truth. Righteousness and faithfulness. The law came through Moses. Righteousness and truth 
came through the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamp. The, le the, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the faultling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the wind child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all, in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In the reigning of Christ, these things shall happen. It shall be a kingdom of peace, no one eating another. It is a God-sustained economy where God rules with righteousness and the truth, and his glory covers the entire waters, entire, entire world, and his knowledge uh, the, uh, you know, shall be so great as the waters of the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him. You and me are Gentiles. Those of us who are not Jews, we are Gentiles and we are seeking after him. And his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Patros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Amath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will stab and will, will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the fourth corner of the earth from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. I told you when you were reading uh, chapter number 10, that Ephraim had an issue with Judah, and the issue was envy. He envied Judah so much. You know, Judah was the chosen. Remember, Judah means a praise. So Judah, God chose Judah. And always God will say that Judah will go first. Whenever the breaking come, Judah will go first. Whenever they're going for war, Judah will come first. And we talked about this and we said Judah actually means praise. So God says praise will go first. And out of Judah, he said, Judah, you shall give forth, you know, uh, uh, the scepter. You shall handle the scepter, shall not depart from the tribe of Judah, meaning leadership will always be from the tribe of Judah. And from there, we saw God chose in the house of Jesse, David. And from David, he made a covenant with him. He says, you know, I've made a covenant with David that he shall not lack descendants to sit upon the throne. And when God talked about that, he did, he did not only speak about the natural throne that is in the house of Israel, but he also spoke about the heavenly throne, the kingdom of heaven. And Judah shall not harass Ephraim, but they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder of the people of the east. They shall have unity. They shall be one again. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind he will shake his feast over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel. In that day, in that day that he came up, in that day that he came up from the land of Egypt, and in the day you will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Remember we talked about this when you were looking at, uh, uh, at, at 
Psalms when David was writing the psalm and he's telling God, God, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Salvation and joy go hand in hand. Every believer, not, I'm not talking about happiness. Happiness is a result of things happening, right? And you feel I'm happy today. This has happened. But talking about joy. joy. Joy supersedes good things happening in your life. You know, God wants you to walk with joy. And he says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but it's of power, love, and of a sound mind. He talks about, you know, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those who are in God's kingdom, those who are heirs of salvation, joy should be our portion. And when we go to read in the book of Galatians, when we're reading about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, part of that fruit is joy. So as believers... We are expectant to walk with joy. If you have lost joy, pray like David, pray, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And in that day you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds. Among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. He says, you know, that day will come when the kingdoms will be restored, when the peace will be restored, when the yoke of the Assyrian will be lifted up. You know, there shall be joy because the Lord God has saved the nation of Israel. Remember, when all is said and done, this shall be the greater picture after the marriage, the, oh no, after the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we shall feast at the, at the, at the, at the, at the bridegroom's, you know, the uh, uh, supper, the marriage feast supper. You know, it will be joy. When we are reigning again here with Christ for a thousand years, the millennium reign, we shall look at it when we are coming, uh, when we are reading uh, the book of uh, Revelation. When we are looking at the millennial reign, it shall be all joy. It shall be gladness that fills our heart. Praise be the name of the living God. Now remember, as you read through the prophecies, Remember one thing about God. He talks about what will come. He talks about the judgment will come. And he also talks about the restoration of his people. Why? Because God is a good God and is a God of mercy. His punishment for his people is not to, to make himself feel great, but he punishes us because he loves us. He disciplines us because he loves us. We shall read that when we come to read the book of Hebrews. You shall see it. God disciplines those that he loves. Remember, even we, I said, we were disciplined by our parents because they loved us. Why? They were shaping us to be the people that they had dreamt for us to be. People who are walking uprightly, people who are truthful, people who are honest. That's why we were being beaten or being disciplined by our own parents. In the same way, God disciplines those he loves. Why? Because he's shaping you and, and carving you to become the person that he created you to be, to fulfill his purpose and your assignment as you pursue your destiny here on earth. So we've come to the end of our reading today. I want to believe it has been a blessing to you. May the Lord watch over you and keep you. And may, you see, may we see you tomorrow, same time, same place. May God bless you.